<laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Ready to go? Thank you. Eight weeks ago, I flew from Washington, D.C. to Birmingham, Alabama. Next to me was a young fellow in his late 20s, and I found out that uh, he spent a year in Afghanistan and a year in Iraq. I asked him whether he had a chance to visit Israel during his R&R uh, time, and he said, not exactly R&R, but I'm a member, he said, of, the, of one of the U.S. Army elite units. And just like every other elite unit on its way to Iraq or Afghanistan, so did I go through four weeks of training in Israel. And I was privy to training by your top experts on suicide bombers, car bombs, and the most deadly element against Americans in Afghanistan and Iraq, the IEDs, the Improvised Explosive Devices. And certainly we were trained by your top experts on urban warfare, because just like you, we face very, very different type of human beings, terrorists who use human shield. And you have perfected methods to minimize civilian casualties and to maximize protection for counterterrorism. And he concluded by saying that he credits much of the fact that his unit came back to the U.S. without a single fatality to those four weeks in Israel. The following day in Birmingham, I had an appointment with the president of the Birmingham Southern College. The president happens to be retired General Chuck Krulik, a former commandant, commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps. And we spoke about Iran, and we spoke about Iraq, and then I asked him whether during his service he had a chance to spend time with Israelis, and was it helpful to him? He looked at me like a professor looking at a freshman student upon the first day in class, and he said, you know nothing about Fort Leavenworth, do you? And I said, well, all I know is that Fort Leavenworth is a major U.S. Army base. He said, what do you mean major Army base? This is the intellectual mecca of the U.S. Army. This is where we formulate our battle tactics. And how do you think we formulate our battle tactics if not according to the Israeli book? We follow what you have taught us. And we take advantage of your track record and experience. That evening, I was invited to a reception at the home of one of the state legislators in Birmingham. <clears throat> and one of the guests was a retired U.S. Marine Corps. And once again, I asked the same question. Did you have any experience with Israelis? I said, what do you mean experience? I'm an officer. And in the academy that I had to enroll to get my rank, we studied urban warfare according to your models. And those were Israeli trainers who taught us. And the model was built by Israelis in accordance with the Israeli experience fighting terrorism in Gaza and to an extent in Lebanon. Because of you, we have been able to fight the way we do in both Afghanistan and, uh, and Iraq. The reality is that in 2013, gone are the days where U.S.-Israel relations used to be a one-way street. U.S. gave and Israel received with much, much, much gratitude. In 2013, it's a win-win, mutually beneficial, two-way street between the U.S. and Israel, with Israel playing a larger role by the day, benefiting vital American economic and national security interest. In the early 1950s, Israel was perceived by the vast majority of American policymakers, the so-called elite American media, and many in the armed forces as a burden, as a liability. 
when General Omar Bradley, then the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, dared admit that the U.S. underestimated the Jewish muscle and overestimated the Arab muscle, and therefore the U.S. should enhance, upgrade the level of its association with Israel to the level of a major ally in the Middle East, his proposal was not given any hearing. It was dismissed, even, I would say, with the spies. At that time, Iran and, each, and uh, Turkey were the major allies of the U.S. By 2013, Iran has been transformed into the chief enemy of the U.S., while Turkey is straying away by the day from the West and focusing more and more on its Islamic agenda. There was a perception that Egypt could be a major ally of the U.S. and Alexandria was supposed to become a very friendly home port for the U.S. Sixth Fleet. By now, it seems to me, it requires a great deal of delusion to assume that Egypt is a major ally, whether ruled by the non-democratic military clique or by the non-democratic Muslim Brotherhood. And certainly the port of Alexandria is at best a question mark. Again, I think for the gullible ones. But realistically speaking, Alexandria is not a home port, an effective home port for the U.S., and certainly when we look at the Arab tsunami engulfing the Middle East from Northwest Africa all the way to the Persian Gulf, and I would, add, I would add, you ain't seen nothing yet. Certainly when we look at the Middle East as it is today, the Arab street, the stormy Arab tsunami, it has highlighted Israel as the only capable and stable and reliable, effective economically and militarily, the only democratic and foremost, the only unconditional ally of the USA. Not only in the Middle East, by the way, in the world as a whole. To be very, very direct, no one can really take Europe to be an effective ally. They do have the capability but they certainly lack the will. With Israel, it's both the capability and the will, which has made Israel, the Jewish state, a unique ally of the U.S. in the world at large, especially at a time when the U.S. has chosen to retreat, evacuating Iraq and shortly evacuating Afghanistan, in my mind, under the very superficial delusion that the farther you run away from terrorists, the farther you are from terrorism. And I'm reminded of what a friend of mine, Jim Shope, businessman from Cleveland, told me years ago. You Israelis should study football because in football you learn the closer you are to your own end zone, the closer is the other team to score a touchdown. And if you want to score a touchdown, stay as close as possible to their own end zone. That's how you Israelis should fight terrorism. And Jim has been right. But today the U.S. administration has chosen to ignore the fundamentals of American football. And certainly at this time, with an American retreat, with a devastating cut of the U.S. defense budget, while the Russians and the Chinese deepened their penetration into the Middle East and beyond the Middle East, with the threats to America intensifying by the day. At that time, the question is, who is that element that could bridge the gap between the shortened American strategic hand on one hand and the intensifying needs on the other hand. And once again, it's only the Jewish state which can make a difference. 
a game-changing difference by being, as we have been, the most effective outpost serving vital American interest and American beachhead in this very critical area. And this sort of very unique benefit to America from the Jewish state is not limited to national security. There are today in Israel <clears throat> over 300 American high-tech giants. They operate in Israel not because of the cost of operation, because the salaries, the cost of high-tech in Israel and the U.S. are more or less the same. They are in Israel because that's where they operate more and more of their research and development centers with the aim to leverage the brain power of the Jewish state. Per every 10,000 Israelis, you have 140 dealing with research and development. That's the highest ratio anywhere in the world. The number two country is the U.S. Israel has 140 per 10,000. U.S. has 85 per 10,000. Obviously, the U.S. has many, 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 many more 10,000s than we do in Israel. But it provides you an idea about the very unique asset for the American high-tech industry which exists in Israel. And that has produced, for instance, 55% of Hewlett Packard's recent developments. The <clears throat> former CEO of Intel told the management of Intel in Santa Clara in the Silicon Valley, if not for our four research and development centers in Israel, we, Intel, would have been decimated by the competition. The CEO of Microsoft said recently that Microsoft is becoming an Israeli company by the day due to the impact, the growing impact, of the two significant research and development centers of Microsoft which operate in Israel. IBM just acquired its 13th Israeli company. And they do not acquire Israeli companies in order to transfer it to America. They acquire Israeli companies in order to leverage and expand the benefit from the existing brain power there in Israel. One of the most conservative investors in America conservatives investment-wise, not so much politically, Warren Buffett, he <clears throat> acquired 80% of one of the leading Israeli companies for $4 billion back in 2006. The transaction was signed a few weeks before the war between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. The plant which he acquired is literally on the Lebanese frontier. Warren Buffett had an escape clause, which he chose not to use. And in fact, when the war was over, he acquired another Israeli company for $116 million. And about a year ago, he completed the acquisition of the 80% by adding $2 billion more for the remaining 20%. Expressing again the confidence in the long-term viability of the Jewish state and, and its unique capabilities, which are, again, assisting the U.S. Because while some people call Israel the startup nation, and we are in many respects a startup nation due to the number of high-tech startups which pop out literally, literally every single day in the country, but at the same time, it seems to me, that it's much more fitting when it comes to U.S.-Israel relations to refer to Israel as the pipeline nation. We have become the pipeline of cutting-edge technologies from Israel to the U.S. industry. And it's those cutting-edge technologies which have expanded the American employment base, enhanced the American research and development base, and have increased American exports throughout the world. And that's another aspect of the very unique two-way street 
mutually beneficial win-win type of relationship which resemble no other set of relationships between the U.S. and any other country in the world. We're talking about national security at a time with intensifying threats to the USA. We're talking about U.S. House, U.S. Senate intelligence committees which are aware of the fact that the scope of intelligence derived by the U.S. from Israel exceeds that which the U.S. receives from all NATO countries combined. And this is very pertinent intelligence on the issue of the clear and present threat to America posed by Islamic terrorism, it's intelligence on Iran's nuclear and litany of other threats which impact U.S. national security in general and homeland security in particular. We're talking about Israel and its battle tactics, as I mentioned before, and the U.S. has leveraged that battle tactic for many, many, many years. In 67, in the aftermath of the Six Days War, the U.S. sent 15 generals and colonels to Israel to study the Israeli battle tactics, as well as the Soviet military systems which were captured by Israel. At the end of some two months stay in Israel, they came back with a very heavy volume with lessons which enhanced the American defense industry and American military performance. And therefore, at the end of the Yom Kippur Wars, 1973 war, a team of 50 generals and colonels came to Israel. And this time they stayed for more than half a year. And when they came back with lessons on the battle tactics and on the captured Soviet military systems, they had with them five very heavy volumes, which again enhanced the industrial performance and enhance the military performance on the battlefield. We're talking about benefits from Israel's military capabilities, which go back, for instance, to 67. Some refer to it as a miraculously, uh, miraculous uh, victory by Israel, but others who look at the strategic area of the Middle East realize 1967 was a very special prize to vital American interests. In 1967, we decimated the military ruler of Egypt, President Nasser, who was fighting at that time in Yemen with an attempt to surge to Saudi Arabia through Yemen, topple the House of Saud, cause a ripple effect throughout the Persian Gulf, deal the U.S. interest a major blow and hand to his patrons in Moscow a major, major bonus, all of which was interrupted, aborted by that Israeli victory in 1967, which snatched the Saudis from a jaw of a very, very painful oblivion. In 1970, the pro-Soviet Syria invaded the pro U.S. Jordan. Jordan has never been a match for Syria. In 1970, U.S. was, no, was not in a, in a position to extend any hand to Jordan due to U.S. involvement in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. President Nixon called Prime Minister Golda Meir, laid out the reality of the mutuality of threat to both U.S. and Israel, and within 24 hours, Israel mobilized its reservists to the joint Israeli-Syrian-Jordanian frontier. The following day, the Syrian invasion was rolled back into Syria without firing a single bullet. Israel's posture of deterrence did the job without requiring a single American boot on the ground. And it, once again, it saved the Saudis from the jaws of defeat because the in, idea was for Syria 
to take over the control of Jordan and from Jordan to surge southward and topple the house of Saud and Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Kuwait and Bahrain and once again to render their patrons in Moscow a big victory and deal a blow to the U.S. That type of operation by Israel also turned around President Nixon, who was not known for his positive attitude towards Jews, and that's an understatement, but also was very, very apathetic to negative on Israel. That show of capability by Israel convinced him that there was one ally in the entire world who was able and willing to snatch the hottest chestnut out of the fire for the U.S., and that was Israel. That's the, res the reason, by the way, why in 1973 it was Nixon overruling Kissinger and Schlesinger and other bureaucrats who did not want to send the necessary military systems to Israel. It was the president who said, Israel will get it right away, because he knew U.S. could not afford to lose such a unique ally in the Middle East. And certainly in 1981, when Israel took on the Iraqi nuclear reactor, we did it in defiance of the U.S. President Reagan at that time threatened Israel with a military embargo threaten Israel with suspension of joint military exercises and with suspension of the shipment of very vital military systems. Prime Minister Begin defied the odds and he took on the Iraqi nuclear reactor and indeed the following day we were punished severely by the US which condemned us as modern day pirates. But after four months, common sense dawned upon the White House and attitudes was changed dramatically and a memorandum of understanding between the two countries was concluded, expanding cooperation in an unprecedented manner. They realized Israel was a very, very important ally. And that ally also has to do with the U.S. defense industry, as, by the way, demonstrated by an area not far from here, General Dynamics plant in Fort Worth, Texas, next door. This is where they manufactured the F-16. I paid a visit to the plant, and the plant manager introduced me to what he refers as the secret weapon of the General Dynamics operation. Those are 20 Israeli Air Force men on location 24-7. And the reason they're there is very simple. They share with the manufacturer real-time online every hour of the day. Lessons learned by Israelis, not only flying, but also maintaining and repairing and upgrading. And we certainly want to get next time a better generation of the F-16. And as a result, we share our findings with the manufacturer. When I asked the plant manager how many upgrades have originated through those Israeli lessons, he said well over 700. For instance, the firing control, 75% based on the Israeli experience. Cockpit, 50%, based on the Israeli experience. And when I asked him if he could quantify, in dollar terms, the value of those well over 700 modifications, he said, well, we never took an account of that, but ballpark, he said, mega billion dollar bonanza to the manufacturer. One can assume that a very similar bonanza is the share of McDonnell Douglas, the F-15. One can assume that the manufacturers of, of the tanks and the armed personnel carriers and well over 1,000 military systems which are manufactured in America, employed by Israel, benefit in a very, very significant manner. I remember visiting the office of then uh, Congressman Zach Wamp from Tennessee, I don't know if anybody here from Tennessee who knows 
uh, Zach uh, Wamp. He was a very senior member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Homeland Security. Unfortunately, at least from my perspective, he, uh, he uh, d was defeated in his uh, race for governorship and gave up a very, very substantial seat uh, for Tennessee uh, and for common sense in the, uh, in, in the House. And we paid a visit, uh, one of the former Homeland Security cabinet members and myself, we came with an aim to introduce three new, three additional Homeland Security projects which would bind together the U.S. and Israel, benefiting from Israel's experience. And as we entered the office, Congressman Zach Wamp said, gentlemen, you don't need to say a word. I am an enthusiastic supporter, and let me tell you why. First of all, I'm a firm believer in Judeo-Christian values, and you are the Jewish state, so I'm a supporter. Secondly, I'm one of the more valiant counter-terrorism legislators on Capitol Hill. For me, Israel is the role model, the icon of countering terrorism. But most importantly, he said, I'm here to serve my constituents. And in my district, he said, in Chattanooga area, there is a Northrop Grumman plant. And that plant manufactures, among others, the robots, which neutralize explosives. You guys are the number one customer. But you are a very unique customer because once a week, you hold a video conference with the manufacturer and you share with them ideas about improving because unfortunately you use it every single day in Israel. And the plant manager told me, said Zach Wan, that because of you guys, everybody in the world now wants to buy the same robot. So we are making Bonanza based on your own uh, appearance as our major customer. Secondly, he said, your input, Opa. I'm, I apologize. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Just reported me another contribution, right. Oh. Oh. Let me just turn it off. That's it, okay. Uh, and he said, because of you guys, we are manufacturing much more in my district. My employment base has expanded. And the plant manager told me, he said, it's not only the research and development, but it would have taken us 20, maybe 30 years. Who knows if we would have ever reached the level of research and development that the Israelis share with us because of the very unique Israeli experience. And therefore, folks, you bring those projects, and I'm going to support them because it's good for my constituents, it's good for America. When we left the office, the Homeland Security the minister from Israel asked me, did you write those talking points for the congressman? And I said, absolutely not. But if you would spend enough time on the Hill, you would find out this is a typical office on Capitol Hill because most districts in America benefit from the Israeli experience. Some know that, some are not aware of that, but the involvement is growing by, uh, by the day. We are, t we are talking... Is that a sign that I need to sign off, or? <laughs> I say, okay. Uh, one, one, can, one can go on and on and discussing the litany of examples binding together the U.S. and Israel and the growing role played by Israel benefiting America's economy and national security and homeland security. But it seems to me that the best way to summarize, to summarize the unique role played by Israel is to refer to the late General Alexander Haig, who was Supreme Commander of NATO, who was U.S. Secretary of State, and one of the most ardent supporters of expanded U.S.-Israel cooperation. And whenever he was asked, General, how come you're such an enthusiastic supporter of the U.S.-Israel programs? And his response was as follows. I support expanded cooperation with the Jewish state 
because Israel is the largest American aircraft carrier which doesn't require a single American aircraft or boot on board. It cannot be sunk. It's deployed in one of the most critical areas for America's economy and national security. And if there wouldn't have been an Israel in the eastern flank of the Mediterranean, the U.S. would have to dispatch a few more real aircraft carriers with tens of thousands of American soldiers, which would have cost the American taxpayer some $15 billion annually, all of which is spared by one Jewish state in the eastern flank of the Mediterranean. It seems to me that Al Haig's concise, although relatively long sentence, is very, very real description of the unique unique contribution by Israel. How, how long do I have or do I have to sign off? I don't have a wristwatch, I'm sorry. You've got 30 minutes. Oh, okay. the, the reality of Israel's contribution is also enhanced by an issue which is unknown to most friends of Israel, and that is the demography of Israel. The conventional so-called wisdom suggests that Jews are Westerners and therefore Jews multiply slower than third worlders and Arabs are third worlders and therefore they multiply much faster than Jews in Israel and one does not have to be supposedly demographer statistician to conclude that the only question is when and not whether Israel would become a Jewish minority society. Well, just like many conventional so-called wisdoms, this one too has absolutely nothing to do with reality. And just like all other or most other political correct ideas, this too needs revamping. And I would like to share with you some uh, of the facts about that issue because it has to do with the future of U.S.-Israel relations. It has to do with the question, can we count on Israel on the long run? Will Israel be there, a Jewish state, a qualitative Jewish state, also in 30, 40, 50 years, or will it be transformed into a so-called binational state, a minority Jewish uh, state? In a nutshell, we're talking today about a reality whereby the fertility rate, number of babies per average Jewish woman in Israel, exceeds all Arab countries other than three, Yemen, Iraq, and Jordan, which are coming down rapidly towards West Europe. And this is not a particular reality of any one country. This is a reality, a demographic reality, which characterizes the entire Muslim world other than Sub-Sahara. Whether it is the most Shiite country, Iran, or the most Sunni, Wahhabi Arab country, a Muslim country, Saudi Arabia, we are talking about the Europeanization or Westernization of Muslim demographics. In Iran, in Iran, where it was roughly seven, eight babies per woman 30 years ago, 1.8 babies per woman today. We're talking about 2.3 babies in Saudi Arabia, trending towards two and below two. We're talking about 1.8, 1.9 in North African countries, 2.5 in the other Persian Gulf countries. Egypt, where Jihan Sadat tried to bring about family planning and for which she had to protect her life very, very uh, rapidly because of the threats over her life for suggesting family planning, Today in Egypt, 2.9 babies per woman and trending towards 2.5. Same thing in Syria. In Israel, the average Jewish 
fertility is in excess of three. We're talking about a surge in Israel at a time when the very, very religious Jews, which we refer to as ultra-Orthodox or Haredi Jews, are coming down in fertility. Because irrespective of politics in Israel, the fact is they are integrated in very, very substantial number, more and more into the employment market, in smaller number, but steadily, they are also joining the Israeli Defense Forces, and as a result, fertility has come down to an extent. But for the first time in Israel, the last 10 years, the secular folks are contributing much more than any time before. The one or two of the yuppies of Tel Aviv, that's the secular capital of Israel, the one or two babies of 20 years ago has been transformed into three or four babies per yapi, per which means in our uh, context it means cosmopolitan, liberal, leftist, pistic, whatever, anti-religious, but between three and four babies per woman, per woman. I'm told by my high-tech friends in the Tel Aviv area who come occasionally to the U.S. to talk about joint ventures with their colleagues, that when they, when they uh, depart from business, uh, business exchanges and talk about families, and the Israeli guys say, well, I have four kids, and the immediate reaction is, oh, are you religious? <laughs> In Israel, you don't have to be religious to have three or four babies. The surge, the surge of, in the number of Jewish babies is depicted through statistics. In 1995, 80,000 ba Jewish babies were born in Israel. In 2012, 130,000 Jewish babies were born in Israel. A 62% surge in the number of Jewish babies between 1995 and 2012. We're talking about that surge, that surge at a time when the annual number of Arab babies has remained the same. And the very rapid decline in Arab fertility has been modernity driven, primarily expansion of education among Arab women. Today, in Judea and Samaria, as well as in pre-67 Israel, every single Arab girl completes high school. An increasing number enrolls in community colleges and universities. And that means that unlike the practice 10, 15 years ago, they do not get married at the age of 15 and start reproduction at the age of 16. They do get married at the post-20. And by the year, it gets closer to 30. Moreover, we're talking about urbanization, especially in Judea and Samaria. In 1967, 70% of Arabs in Judea and Samaria were rural. Rural environment tends to bring to produce higher fertility. Today, 75% of Arabs in Judea and Samaria are urban, which lends itself to less and less children. Family planning has become very intensified throughout the Muslim world. The number one Muslim entity as far as the use of contraceptives has been Morocco. 75% of Moroccan women age 15 through 49, the reproductive age, use contraceptives or other means to avoid birth. The number two Muslim entity as far as contraceptives is the Palestinian Authority. 71% of Arab women in Judea Samaria use contraceptives. Moreover, we're talking about emigration from Judea and Samaria. Emigration means almost entirely young people in their reproductive age. Emigration, by the way, was rampant until 67. 
between 1950 and 67, when Jordan occupied Judea Samaria and Egypt occupied Gaza, there was a flood of emigration, 30, 40,000 every single year, net, net emigration. 67, Israel's control of Judea Samaria, the so-called, the so-called oppressive Zionist occupation has brought emigration to a screeching halt. It has brought immigration to a screeching halt because for the first time, somebody built infrastructures in Judea, Samaria, and in Gaza. Health infrastructures, medical infrastructures, educational and employment, while also facilitating access to infrastructures within the Green Line. As a result, incentives for emigration was reduced dramatically. As a result, infant mortality, which was egregious before 67, trended towards zero, towards the level of the Jewish state. And life expectancy increased dramatically. Employment is available, medical is available, all of which, as I said, brought emigration to a screeching halt. However, the year 2000, the eruption of a wave of terrorism initiated by the Palestinian Authority against Israel has resumed large-scale emigration because emigration is a result, among other things, of restive atmosphere. The more restive the atmosphere, the higher emigration away from the, uh, from the area. We're talking today about 18,000 annual net emigration from Judea and Samaria alone, between 15 and 20,000 a year from the Gaza Strip. At the same time, we are talking about net immigration into Israel. Namely, Israel today benefits from a, the Jews in Israel benefit from a robust tailwind of fertility and a robust tailwind of migration balance. We are talking about demography in Israel, which always suggests doomsday for the Jews. But this is not something new. In 1900, when Theodor Herzl was fighting for a Jewish state, he had to face top demographers among the Jews in Europe who opposed the establishment of a Jewish state on ground of demography. They produced projections, and the projections suggested that when it comes to balance between Jews and Arabs, by the year 2000, there could not be more, there would not be more than 500,000 Jews. That was a projection conducted in 1900 towards the year 2000. It was conducted by the number one demographer, number one Jewish historian of those days, Shimon Dubnov, who was off by roughly five and a half million Jews. The eve of the Declaration of Independence, the founding father of the Jewish state, David Ben-Gurion, was faced by the same type of phenomena. The leading statistician, the leading demographer of those days, Professor Roberto Bacchi, later on the founder of the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, he forewarned Ben-Gurion not to rush, because 600,000 Jews, he was told, Ben-Gurion was told, would become, within 20 years, a minority. And a projection was conducted by, was prepared by the number one demographic statistician, was given to Ben-Gurion and other leaders of the Jewish community then in Israel, suggesting that by the year 2001, there couldn't be more than 2.3 million Jews west of the Jordan River, they were off by four million Jews. The bottom line of the current demographic balance between Jews and Arabs west of the Jordan River is that in the combined area of Judea, 
Samaria, and the pre-67 Israel, otherwise known as the Green Line Israel, there is today a 66% Jewish majority, but 66% majority benefiting from a robust tailwind, while the Arabs are experiencing unprecedented decline, decline as far as demographics, also benefiting from a migration tailwind. Uh, anybody who says, well, 66% majority is very worrisome, and it's a cause to contemplate departure from geography in order to preserve demography. We must put numbers in a proper perspective, a proper context. And a responsible context does not focus on today, but takes into account the last 50, 100, or hundreds, or thousand years, and at least 50, 100 years from today especially when it comes to a Jewish state. And when you look at 1900, when Theodor Herzl started his voyage towards a Jewish state, in the combined area of Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, we had a minority of 9% Jews. In 1947, eve of Declaration of Independence, in that combined area, Judea, Samaria, and Priest 7 Israel, we had a minority of 39%. And today, we have a majority of 66%. The trend is very, very clear, especially when one looks at the potential of Aliyah currently from Russia, from Ukraine, from Germany, France, England, Argentina, to an extent from this country as well, on ground of economic performance by Israel, on ground of Russia, Ukraine, Europe, Argentina, on ground of anti-Semitism, on the ground of Islamic penetration into France and England and Belgium and Holland and Scandinavia, which again has been an enticement for more Aliyah to Israel. When you consider that element, we are talking a very, very doubly so robust tailwind. And certainly, anybody who's concerned about 66% Jewish majority should remember the founding father, Ben-Gurion, when he accepted the partition plan, he accepted a Jewish state within the partition lines of 55% Jewish majority. In 2013, we perform not only much better than any time in recent history, but if anybody would have told Ben-Gurion, who was the ultimate optimist, that by the year 213, from 600,000 Jews in 48, we are going to catapult to 6.3 million Jews, Ben-Gurion would ask you, what have you been drinking and what have you been smoking? And certainly, when we talk about that demographic tailwind, it has economic ramifications. It has national security ramifications. It has American ramifications. Because Israel today is the only, the only developed country in the world with fertility in excess of three babies per woman, which means a rosy economic future. Rosy economic future, rosy high-tech future, because we talk about not only qualitative, uh, quantitative edge, we also talk about a quality type of an edge. And certainly that type of fertility suggests that as far as our national security, our, our security is in the hand of a growing community, not a shrinking community, and the recruit classes of Israel are going to be larger and larger, which would be a proper and appropriate response for any threats around, uh, around us. The bottom line is, when it comes to U.S. and Israel, as everybody here in this room definitely knows, while the foundations have been Judeo-Christian, not from 48 and not from the Holocaust and not even from 1776. 
and not even from the Arabella and the, and the Mayflower, but indeed, as uh, Rabbi Dean mentioned, going back to the Puritans, to Wycliffe, who was the first translator of the Bible, and Cromwell, etc. This is the foundation of the special relations between the U.S. and Israel, the Judeo uh, state. But on top of those foundations, we have also seen additional elements of that unique friendship, and that are, those are the mutual threats and the joint interests facing both countries. And to use uh, colloquialism, which I remember from my days as Council General in Texas, when it comes to U.S. and Israel and the viability and the advantages of uh, our cooperation, we should heed that colloquialism which, su which suggests that two guns shoot much longer than one. Thank you very much. <laughs> may wonder why he went through this demographic exercise. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but that is the primary argument the left in Israel uses to do the peace, the crazy peace agreements, is it not? In other words, we have to separate and make two states uh, or we will be uh, overwhelmed. And what he's showing is uh, what, they, what the left assumes be true is not true, and uh, therefore that removes the major obstacle uh, in, in their minds for having a two-state solution and things like that. So thank you.